Hey everybody, registration is now open for our seventh annual summit. Is that right, Peter, our seventh? Seventh. That's crazy. That so great. this time at the beautiful JW Marriott Camelback at Scottsdale, Arizona, you can immerse yourself in innovation, inspiration, unite your team, which is most important, and at the same time, earn 16 CE credits. That's Renew crazy. your practice, transform your life, June 14th and 15th, registration's now open. Don't delay. These things always sell out. This one will as well. Go to bulletproofsummit.com. Two days that will redefine your practice life. We guarantee it. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. And today we have a very special guest, uh, a personal friend of ours, and now an author, Dr. Sulman Ahmed from Ideal Dental. Uh, Sulman, it's good to have you here. Great to have you and great to see you guys again. Yeah, man. So um, I just want, in full disclosure, I actually read the entire book, just so you know, Solomon. I listened to it on Audible, uh, finished it up yesterday, and was texting Peter the entire time. It, literally, I had chapters. no less than five texts from him being like, dude, his book's really good. You got to read it. And I'm like, so finally, I, I am in full disclosure halfway through with it, but uh, I would concur. I would concur. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. It's always, uh, you know, when you when you write a book and you know, the challenge is always, well, who am I writing this for? And so when I started writing this book, it was after COVID and I did it as a diary for my kids. Cause I feel mm -hmm. like in today's <laughs> world, even more, we're all so busy, but like, if I were to ask you guys, Hey, yeah. Do you know your grandfather? Yeah, of course I know. Right. Do you remember his name? Yeah. Great. Do you know where he lived? Great. Do you know what he did for a living? Yeah. He did this. Do you remember how he felt the first time he got fired from his job or the first time he took a risk or the first time he asked for a loan at his house? No, no idea. And I think, a lot of us just kind of fall into that trap where we just assume it's just, we're going through our battles and that's the end of it. And so it started out as a diary and then it turned into a lot of people in dental and outside of dental business, people, entrepreneurs just saying, Hey, I'm trying to get, I've grown my business to 25 million and I've self-funded it. How do I get funding? Do I go VC? Do I do private equity? Do I keep self-funding? And then how do I know when to bring on a CFO and I'm interviewing this person and he wants X, Y, Z, and he wants half the company. Should I do that? So it was, it was no different than just talking and helping other people and being on different, um, speaking kind of engagements where you're leading a conference and some, you know, you're talking about how you built your business and the stages of growth. And so about, I would say about a year and a half or so ago, you know, I was just thinking, I've got all this stuff of personal, and then I've got all this stuff of business. And if I can put it in a book, because the questions are pretty much the same, depending on where you are in your stage of growth. And we've had many such conversations like what's next, you know, and that could be personal, it could be professional. So the book really embodies my journey from, you know, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, growing up there, moving to the US at the age of 19, thinking I'm pursuing the American dream, but having no idea what that is. And then later understanding what that was and and um you know and then and then it goes beyond that i think you reach a certain point and, and then it's like well what what's next and i think for me it was giving back in the form of this book what i mean by that is you guys have read this and i think the book is pretty raw and 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 true and and uh i haven't sugarcoated anything i've shared specific numbers on the amount of debt I was under, what that felt like, the savings in my bank account and, you know, valuations a couple of years ago. And I've only done that because in the hope that there's other people who are not in as bad of a situation as I was, and hopefully this encourages them to be like, man, if he could do it, I absolutely need to do something and, and you know, take that next step. And if I can do that for one person, I think the book will have been worth its while for me going through it. So. That's kind of the goal of the book is to there just was an authentic vulnerability to even this the part that i've gotten to and kind of craig kind of said that as well yeah. do you think it's easier to be that way solman being of where you are in life now is easier to say like look here's all the ass kickings i got and here's the vulnerability but like you're a success story you're an american success story do you think it's easier to kind of look back and say yeah absolutely yeah because before you're too embarrassed to tell anybody like, yeah. what an idiot can barely run right. practice yeah. and, and he's in so much debt, like <laughs> stay away from that guy, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I think, and that's, that's the, that's the time you should share it. Right. Because I think there's too many people who have those struggles and then 
the ones that have success kind of disappear. And look, I was kind of that way too. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, but there just comes a point where, you know, like we grow our dental businesses, it's to help, you know, our staff, you know, provide for their families, touch more patients' lives. And then this was like, how can we help more business people kind of achieve their dreams and realize it's not that far or as far away as we all think, um, you know, things are. So the book yeah, was I, like half for your kids and half for the dental uh, legacy kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah or right. just business, business legacy. Business, change. Yeah. You know, like one person took a chance that they weren't after reading this book and they turn into and then they grew something great and helped more people and customers then you know, it achieved its goal. Yeah, so it's interesting for me, Sulman, because I've known you for a while. I'm, I'm trying to go back to when we first met. But I think it was like 18, right? It was 2018. I think so. Yeah, somewhere around there. So I'm like hearing these moments of vulnerability when you're feeling inauthentic or you're feeling like you're not successful. And I'm like correlating it to the dinners we had. I'm like, like it, I wouldn't have gotten that impression. So I was so thankful that you were sharing these moments of like um, raw emotion of, of what, it, what you were going through at that particular time. And even when you were looking for your first partner and how you threw out a number that you thought was just bananas. Like, Hey, listen, this is the number I'm going to look for. And yeah. then you actually had a partner that's like, you know, we think we can get you that. So it's like, it, it, it was more raw and transparent than I thought it would be, but that's the beauty of the book. And I was, I knew I had this interview with today, but you know, so I started off with the book thinking like, I should just read it just to be able to converse with you. And by the close of the first chapter, I'm like, Oh, damn, this is good. This is really good. Yeah, and that was the hardest part because I did not write the book for it to be published. So as I was writing and I'm mm. like, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm just going to leave it to my kids. I'll never share this with anybody outside my, I don't know, five person, six person family circle. Um, and when it got picked up by a publisher and I was like, well, hang on. If, if we're if this is going to be mass published and sold at Barnes and like everywhere, let me, can I go back and change some stuff? And they're like, you can change some stuff, um, but we really don't want you changing this stuff. And man, there was like a two week kind of timeout mm. where I hadn't signed anything. And I was like, I don't ever want to share that much. And I, it felt, I felt so exposed, and especially when I knew it's coming out um, because you're just so nervous and you're like, man, I, what if I screwed up? What if I shared too much? So I think when you guys give me the feedback that thank you or like, this is awesome, I can't tell you how calming that is at a deep level. It's just like, right, somebody finds value in it. I'm probably overthinking the parts mm -hmm. that matter more. That, than that's the truest. Really Solomon, Solomon, sorry to cut you, but that's the true value of the of the of what you wrote. It's this idea of that, you know, you come over, you, you know, even the fact of how unwelcomed you felt landing in America, how rude the people were. You you grew up under a British form of etiquette. And where is it? Harari, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. And you come here in the first order at Subway, like, what do you want? Like, yeah. next. So like, and, and then not feeling like you fit in, you know, like, who am I? And yeah. you've even made jokes about that in the past. Like, I didn't name it Sulman of a dental, you know? <laughs> yeah. You once said that to me at one point, but I think that's the value to so that the listener can if, if your goal is to inspire somebody to, to take on the next level, that's what I think you've done because you've, you've left all the emotions there, you know, raw for us to, to digest. And, and you know what the funny thing, and I just want to say this one part is I have this, I guess it's a human bias that when I look at someone successful, whether they're fit or they're have success in business, my bias always tells me somehow they got lucky. Somehow they didn't <laughs> work so hard and the overarching thing that I kept texting Peter is Sulman is willing to work so freaking hard. You were willing to work so hard and still are willing your work ethic. The fact that, you know, you talk about micromanagement and the correlation between like, Hey, if your kid had a peanut allergy, would you not micromanage the babysitter or the menu like this? You, you spoke to ideal being a baby for you. And just like another child, you are going to make sure whatever it takes to make it successful. That founder grit is, is just, I, for some reason, I knew you had it. I just didn't know to the extent you had it. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's even gotten heightened over time, you know, and, and it's hard to explain it. Maybe, maybe you guys can relate, but when you achieve a certain level of success, the first time 
it's just to, it's like, oh shit, hang on this. Somebody actually believes that I'm successful. And then it kind of happens again. It's like, all right, we're beyond that. So if, if this, none of this was really supposed to happen, given the odds and it happened, where am I supposed to go with this? And where am I? So if I, if working hard got me to this spot, you know, what if I just keep working even harder? And I think then that starts translating, which you guys can relate to, like life happens, right? I've got four kids, um, you know, at the, at the time, uh, 2021, when we did our, our deal with Blackstone, it was like a really weird time in my life. It was this exciting thing happening. I also lost my mom right around that time. It was like a pillar for me. And I also had the birth of my fourth kid, our son. Um, so it's like in one month, there's all this stuff happening and it really, really force you to like evaluate life and just be like, shit, like life doesn't go on forever. Just had a kid businesses. Like what is the world trying to tell me or what am I supposed to learn and understand from this? So I, you know, there's just, um, and then I think then your grit and perseverance kind of changes, you know, in, in terms of like, all right, let's go. <laughs> let's well is, is it safe to say that you were doing it maybe for personal reasons then it or i don't even get that because you know you speak about your service yeah. and you know dentistry is unfortunate we all know that and most people don't expect a clean they expect a judgmental dentist and a, a threatening environment so i know that you had the mission to change the face of dentistry but is it like the first notch of success is like placating your own ego and then at a certain point you're like okay what now that i have this responsibility and this opportunity what else can i do is that fair to say or it's fair to say i think and i think the ego really comes from a place of insecurity right i mean i, I think i share in my book you know i think there's two points i was really insecure one was when i uh started dental school and you know barely got there and everyone's like oh, i'm gonna specialize and i'm gonna be an oral surgeon i'll be an oral surgeon. like yeah, you know, like we just got here. Like, how do you know what you're <laughs> gonna do for after four years? I was like, you know, and they're like, well, what are you gonna do? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna find a way for all of us to work together. But in, you know, something and got, they laughed at you. Yeah, just something got embedded in my brain, and I forgot about it. And then you start doing it pre clean, and you come out. And you're like, man, if I, now things are starting to come together, and you know, the name Deca was, you know, from the desire of ten offices. And the second time mm -hmm. that insecurity kicked in was when I was trying to expand, and I was at a at one of these dental conferences and you know we had an equipment rep you know you've got the shines and the pattersons and the big groups and you know overheard one of them be like oh it's not going to amount to more than one office it's all going to fail if he tries to do more and one, how did you hear that you heard that so i overheard that or someone told me about it um this was like really like 2009 ish and the market the recession was happening and barely was new dentistry and then trying to figure out the business it was such a punch in the gut, you know, it's like crap. Like I know things aren't going well. And now people who should know the industry don't think it's going well specifically for me and they're talking about it, you know? And so, yeah, think about what, what does that do? There's two ways you either just kind of break down or you just, that chip on your shoulder gets bigger and you're like, yeah, well, I'm going to get bigger. And the first person I'm not going to work with is your company. And, you yeah. know, and so, um, I don't know. I, I think you just have to fuel that that energy and that anger and that insecurity and that ego, which, you know, I think anyone who's achieved some level of success has to have, you know? So now that, you know, you're at the position that you're at, you know, you're, you're, you've grown to more practices and you probably thought initially that you could ever reach. Is there some part of you that's like gotten here and be like, okay, it, it doesn't feel like what it should feel like, or how is it different? I should say than what you contemplated. Yeah. So you, you come over here and for those that, you know, I, I, you've got to read the book, but you know, I mean, the story is, is, is a great story. You're, you ask somebody like, Hey, where's Baywatch film? Someone erroneously tells you it's in Florida. So you wind up in North Florida, not Baywatch. <laughs> and Jackson. you're like sitting, you're sitting there like living in a dorm. Like, I, I don't want to be here. Your dad says, Hey, just give it six weeks. You're like, okay, dad, I'll do that. And then look where you are. I mean, it's just, what is it? 10 years. I mean, to get to a hundred practices, how long from the day you arrive in America to, to like 50 practices, what was that timeline? Yeah. So 
you know, it was probably, yeah, 12 fish kind of years, but then you have college and then dental school and then associateship and then starting out. But yeah, I think, you know, the coin, the, the name DECA was really when we were like at 15 or so locations and I was okay sharing that I wanted 10 locations. That was in 2013. So 11 years ago. Um, right. But from the day you arrived in America to then, so I'm just saying it's a very, it's a very fast growth. Mm -hmm. That you went yeah, through. Yeah, and I think I think you guys in the dental space, so you guys will appreciate that, right? Like, you you can build offices, and you're it's a slow play, and it's one patient at a time, staff member at a time. You're not buying revenue, you're not buying EBITDA, you're not buying staff, and and a lot of our industry is M and A, and that's that model. If you're doing de novo, it's a completely different model. Different model. It's like it's 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 almost like not even the same business. You know, yeah, you're trading dentistry, but you're doing something different. And so it's a lot slower. Um, it is a lot more operationally intensive. So you are really kind of in the business, understanding the dynamics of from floor plans to staffing efficiencies, bays. You know, when do you add days? When do you extend hours? So for me, I'll tell you, that part's been fun, but what's really exciting to me is, is I think uh, what I share with you, Craig, is, you know, launching this ideal dental partnership program. I'm super passionate and excited about that because for the first time after 15 years of doing this and establishing us as a brand in nine states, we're now offering dentists the opportunity to partner with us. So think about it as, you know, do you want to own an ideal dental? And if so, mm -hmm. we're going to partner with you. So if you're in Indiana or wherever, we're going to do the whole thing for you. And it'll, it's a true partnership in the sense that not only can you work in there and, you know, get paid as a dentist, be part of the distributions, but then you get to take part in the equity upside, which is a true wealth creation opportunity. So my goal at this point is to bring in as many dentists and put them in that wealth creation uh, opportunity mode where they can kind of realize some of the upside of being part of a bigger kind of enterprise. And their systems and your processes are already built, right? They're just yeah, built in. Mean, getting it's better every location. So it's, it's like, de-risking, it's de-risking their entrepreneurial spirit, which I, I think it's great. I especially think especially at I think, a time like this, you guys probably know, right? Like new grads coming in, it's, it's different from five. Like when I came out, I just wanted to have a practice and get to a million dollars of revenue. I was like, if you do that, that's the gold standard and I'm done. Things have changed. If you want to be in a big city, it is extremely competitive. There's competition extremely. every corner. It's not even forget about the groups, it's individual dentists. And so unless you go an hour and a half away and you want to just be the only game in town, even, even that doesn't really exist anymore. So uh, I think us taking that, you know, step off and be like, hey, we'll be the backstop here and we'll guarantee all of this stuff and we'll help you do it. And you can keep doing what you're doing anyways. And um, I think it's a great win-win situation. What? I just want to circle back, Pete, because uh -huh. I asked that question and we kind of got tangential for a second. Uh -huh. Sulman, if you don't mind, how is it feeling now? How's it feeling now? Like what, what is, you, you know, is there, because I know kind of like getting everything you ever wanted and, and I'm sure that there's another level, but like, how is it feeling right now for you? Are you yeah. more so, excited? Yeah. So the first, the first, first time when you have that big event is all this, like, you don't know. So you think you're going to change and life's going to change and all these things are going to happen. I think a lot of us dentistry has been a great profession and i think a lot of those things that vices that you want to get out of the way i think i'd already enjoyed you know by the time i did my first transaction so it wasn't about a car or like that and and then people put these expectations like oh what are you gonna do like you know and, and like, yeah now that you're what, retired what are yeah. you gonna do and when it actually you know when it when the transaction happened and the wires kind of hit and everything kind of settles it's it's a feeling like oh wow like okay, I can do whatever I want to do or not do anything. But, but you know, you, the next day you kind of wake up and I don't know, I end, ended up going and doing pretty much the same thing I do every day. And so the second time wasn't even a thought, like I didn't even bother to check and like, yeah, it should be in. Okay, let me check the first time. Refresh, refresh, refresh. <laughs> Did it disappear? <laughs> Why is it? Is there a comma? Wrong? Is it the cutoff time? Is it Eastern? Is it, you know, <laughs> um, so... Yeah, so I think it's That's different cool. at different phases, but I, I, I do remember reading, uh, you know, that book Shoe Dog where Phil Knight, same kind of thing. I think the first time he did it was like 170 million and he's like, I, and it was raining the next day. I woke up, I put on my old sneakers and went for a run. I think, I think that's kind of how I felt. I mean, there's people who, and certainly there have been people in our organization who 
got the money and they're like, I am out to see you. I may have told you something else, but I've thought about it over the weekend and I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm moving to the Bahamas. Yeah, never, never saw that one coming. Uh, and we're still in touch and friends, but not once have they looked back and said, you know, I miss that. Or like, I can't, you know, they'll come to the events and stuff, but they, they couldn't be happier, which, which I'm happy for. And I think there's other people that like, like, and I'm in that where, you know, it's like, what's next and how do you keep growing and how do I, you know, what, what's exciting. And you're just kind of chasing that next thing that you want to prove out. So when are you done then? <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I'm ever done. I think I've Well, started... I don't mean like retiring, playing shuffleboard. I'm yeah, saying like, but... when is the, when is it built? When are you like, this is what I wanted it to be? Yes. Yeah, so I think the business is we open these offices. We acquire offices is that part of the business. Then there's a JV component. I'm working on a, on a product line, which is a completely different part of my brain, which I love because it's creating a brand and redoing that. And then there's these other um, things that I'm a part of that is around giving back and, and building different kind of concepts. And so that part's really, really fun. And it, not, not in, it, it takes up time and there's no financial kind of gain, but I'm finding myself leaning more into that. So I would say as time kind of goes, I'd be more focused on that and still somewhat involved in, in this piece of it too. Let's, uh, let's rewind for a second. Cause I love the, the come up stories, the grind a little bit. So go, I want to hit you up for the story around when you kind of, it seems like you reach peak debt, you were three and a half million dollars in debt without really a plan, so to speak. I mean, you knew your plan, you had your vision of what you wanted to do. What was your inflection point from that point forward where you from where you're like, oh shit, this is gonna work? Like did you have like like some clarity where you're like, this is it. I'm good. Yeah. So I I you know, December two thousand and nine, at that time I had a de novo that was a year old and I I'd acquired an office. So the office I'd acquired had some cash flow coming in, but I was only working there two days a week and four days a week in the de novo. So that was a oh shit moment, like, all right, maybe this isn't going to work. Right. And as you guys know, you know, de novos have a, a ramp, but if you've never done it, you don't, you don't really know because you're paying all the hard costs. And so production really started going up at, at about month 18. And, you know, for us, maturity, even today, now that we've got a lot more, we, we can look at it as a prototype is, is that two and a half to three year window from when we open to like, all right, it's starting to really ramp. Um, and so it really took two and a half years. And as soon as that started cash flowing, mm -hmm. um, and then I was onto my third location, which was an oral surgeon friend's wife was going to file bankruptcy and it was a great location. And they were like, would you just take over the debt and we won't have to file bankruptcy? And I was like, sure. Remember I was, I was single and didn't have, besides the three and a half million dollars of debt, didn't have any other liabilities or didn't, was too naive to realize it. And so. That was, I think, when that de novo started cash flowing, and okay. I, in my first distribution, I was like, "All right, this could work," you know. But, but it was never like you had proven oh, the model, at that or like this is this is off to the races. It was a very kind of subtle, like contentment, like yeah, I mean, you know, some of those decisions of trying to open Saturdays and doing everything under one roof, maybe it works, and patients value that. But it, it's like that world we live in today, where everything on Instagram is like six months of eating clean and doing this and you're going to be a different person. Maybe you'll be a different person, but it's not going to be, you know, and I talk about in the book, I think it takes 10 years of being good every single day to one day being great, at least for most of us. Right. Even, and even yep. gifted in a lot of ways. Yeah. It takes 10 just years to become an overnight success. It takes time. It's just, there's no, and the older I get, the, work, the more I realize it, cause it's, you're younger, you just, one and now it's like why isn't it working i'm spending this much on marketing i'm doing all of this it's been three months i've been watching my diet why am i not you know ripped? it just doesn't work that way <laughs> so. what are the challenges right now like what you know i obviously i know that you know when i read the book i saw there were times where you were sleepless and thinking about things is there things that are keeping you sleepless right now yeah, you know, I think so. In the in the book, I talk about work life balance, and to me, like for anyone who's achieved something, I don't. There's got to be a skewed work life balance at times where it's like it's always a myth, right? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, never life, a complete balance. Yeah, w wife's not happy because I'm working too much, missing kids games, but it's all about work. And then, you know, as you get successful, it's like, hey, I'm completely off work. I'm with my kids, and that's all I care about. But this whole notion, I think it's too 
like mainstream America and like, oh, I have a steady job and I work this much and I get weekends off and I'm home by this time and I have work life balance. But, you know, I, I don't really believe in that. So I think for me, Craig, um, you know, I think having those times kind of carved out where I can do what I want to do, but I can do it under my own kind of schedule, you know, and then being able to control that feels really good. I think it's autonomy at the end of the day that that kind of satisfies that. Sure. So at what point, like how old are the kids from top to bottom? How old are you? 10, old is 10, 7, 5, and 2 and a half. Oh, yeah. So you're in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. So the stuff that will bother me is like if one kid is struggling at one thing, that, that keeps me up at night yeah. because it, selfishly we all are motivated people. So it's like, man, am I not doing something right as a totally. dad? All right, what do I need to do? Do I need to get a better coach or – I'm going to start going to every game or, you know, we right. all self-reflect and self-doubt. It's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. yeah my friend once achiever. told me, my friend once told me you're only as happy as your least happy child. Yeah. That's and, so uh, you know, I've had so moments true. where, you know, I had, I was on a plane, fl air, air, I was on a helicopter with an airlifted child to Denver children's one day. And that was like, you know, the lowest possible low you could ever have, but it's true. You know, you never know what a kid needs and being a father is extremely challenging. Yeah. You know, yeah. you just, you kind of, it's like taking a test and waiting 21 years for a result. You don't well, know what's going to work for it. them. You know, husband, father, brother, son, sister, dentist, taking your patients, staff, you know, that like any kind of change. I mean, especially after COVID when it was like the furlough and you got thousands of people and they're kind of looking at you for answers. That was really hard because there no one had any answers. So, yeah, I think we do so much more and the stress comes from so many different angles. And I think a lot of times we just make it look like it's just another day. But, um, I mean, dentistry, even if you have one practice, even if it's not a big, big practice, you're really an entrepreneur running a business uh, and you're kind of on your own. You know, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, and especially now it's like, well, how many locations? Oh, that must be easy doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can have yeah. one location that's it, the revenue doesn't even matter. You, you know, it's like you got certain employees and, and you got to take care of them. <laughs> Tell so me about someone your dad. who's had, uh, you've oh, had sorry. Go two... ahead, Peter, I had another question, but go oh. for it. Then if it stays in the same vein, you can, you, you, you can go. Cause I'm going to jump to, uh, no, I just wanted to know, like, so I, I just, I don't recall reading much about your father and, um, in the book and just, What's his, you know, someone who works with my father, and I know you just recently had that golf outing you did with your dad. And tell me where, what his understanding of what you've done is like was, you know, because he was the guy that when you wanted to call it quits in college, he's like, just give it six weeks. Yeah. So that was a defining moment because had he listened, you know, hey, whatever you want, buddy, I'll send you back home. And we that was a very uh, a book launch party this week. And I know he's probably not going to listen to this podcast. So I can say it's still funny here. But, <laughs> yeah, my dad doesn't um, listen to mine either. Yeah. But yeah, I think I reflect at that moment a lot as a dad now and think about how hard it is if your kid is 19 hours away in a country that you've never been to and he's on the pay phone calling from a calling card where the minutes are going to run out and he's crying and saying, I don't want to be here. Oh, wow. I mean, the first thing you want to do is just hug him and be like, I got you. You don't need to be there. I'm, I've, I've got you. Right. And how hard would it be to just be like, stick it out? Because there's a piece of him that's got to be like, oh, shit, like my son's doesn't have sheets doesn't have any food he's eating campus food he has no friends and he's miserable and he's crying and you know um so obviously that's a whole different level of um you know i, I hope i can be that tough you know one day and i think today i can you know it's funny like at different levels you know the it's never like i am so proud of you son like come over here and give me a hug it's not like that but it'll be every now and then it'll just be like a little pat on the back and just saying, I'm proud of you in a low voice, not even looking you in the eye. And <laughs> that, that like means the world to me, you know, but it's far and few. It's not a, it's yeah. I, I sometimes look at myself I'm like, I'm so proud of you. You hit the ball so far. And I know how nervous you were I'm like, man, I don't know. Maybe we over, yeah, but I don't know what the we're all, is. we're all very different dads. You know, yeah. I mean, we're all roughly the same age. I'm probably, um, got you guys beat by a couple of years, but my dad was not, you know, going to games and telling me like, Hey, I'm proud of you that you put in your effort, you know, but listen, it's obviously what you needed, you right. know, had he been more like maybe my parenting style, it would have been like, Hey son, no problem. You gave it two weeks. I'm <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> I, you know, and, and he had, you know, he mentioned in the book, he didn't want you going to Miami. 
because yeah. he was nervous about, you know, Gianni Versace's death. He yeah. thought, you know, Miami's a dangerous place. So, you know, having an, an adult crying son on a payphone is for most of us, if we're being intellectually honest, that we would want to rescue our kid. Yeah. And just to clarify, like I wasn't like weeping on the phone, but. Oh, know. whatever, dude. Oh, <laughs> listen. Yeah, yeah. It, but. <laughs> But there it's were all good. tears that were very evident across <laughs> across the payphone. It doesn't <laughs> listen. You still you had a tear. It's no big deal. There were tears. It's, there were tears. It's okay. I'm sure it wasn't sobbing like the payphone scene in Anchorman. Yeah. Right, right. That's fun. Uh, Sulman, what I was going to ask was that you've had now on your quest, you've had two capitalization events, right? You've had two liquidity events in, in your growth, and you've taken on two different investors. As someone who's done that, you obviously have a lot of uh, experience and contacts and industry intel. How is the market looking now for kind of dental investment? It's funny. Somebody asked that on a different topic just this morning. I think that's a really, really good question. Um, I think like we talked about earlier, there's a big component. So there's the individual dentist, which I can come to next, and I'll talk about DSOs in general. And when I say DSOs, I use that term very loosely because I don't know when I went. We all do. Being qualified. Yeah. So say someone who's got three offices and trying to figure out if you're so. in the M&A business, I think interest rates being high heavily affect your ability to buy because buyers still want a certain multiple and you just between the squeeze of the interest rate, that multiple and what you think you can sell the business for things are really tough. And unless you're going to take some high risk and make some bets, which I think a lot of things in the past 18 months have not really panned out. You know, there hasn't been a, a great successful dental outcome, I would say in that time. And there've been a few things that have gone bust. Um, and so I would say from uh, uh, people looking to invest as outsiders into the dental business, I think the the golden days of like, I have money and I just, it has to be in dental and I don't really care if it's a platform I'm in has changed. And I think that mm. when we were going through our deal, a lot of the big guys, the Black Stones, the Black Rocks, the TPGs, you know, they were like, hey, we don't want another Me Too dental story. Tell me how you're different. We don't want a roll up story. We've heard all of that. There's got to be something different. You know, so that was a factor for us. Um, I think there's so many DSOs that were created, like in, and we've looked at many of these. I know this firsthand in 1819 that really quickly got to like 30, 40 locations and we're trying to sell in 22, 21. And it was really, really hard because you would look at them and you'd be like, okay, you are in five states and you bought these different practices. Great revenue. Great. You'd be like, yeah, look at how we're comping over 2020. And it's like, well, that was COVID. Like I, it's, I'm not really seeing a pattern or a picture here. And, and, and some of those are some of the ones that didn't pan out. And so I think buyers, investors are very aware that not all dental is created equal. And I think the last eight or 10 years where everything just transacted and it was like, oh, I'm coming to market. Oh my God, a crazy multiple. Great. Just add them to the list. I think those days are gone. I think buyers are much more educated and much more aware and uh, I think there's a lot more scrutiny and I think there's going to be a big differentiation between the groups that have been around and have a proven record, whatever that may be, whether it's M&A or De Novo or both or whatever, because there's, a, there's more appreciation. They're like, wow, that's to the test of time. And there's really, it's a solid business versus something that's just been around. I think there's going to be a lot of questions on like, hey, I don't really value the business the same way. So I think there's a differentiation happening between the quality kind of DSOs and the ones that are that are maybe not so much don't really have a differentiator. It's more like I'm just aggregating practice. aggregation. Yeah. Right. And as Craig always says, like the aggregation was wild when interest rates were zero, right? And it was just a game of just free money and game. kind of bolting it on. And now we're seeing that you actually got to have the chops in the operational to yeah. kind of grow that store. Yep. So to speak. And I think that's what you're kind of alluding to is that yeah. we're seeing some some when, blood in the water yeah, right when now. We look at it like you can buy revenue, you can buy EBITDA. Great. Who cares? Tell me if you bought an office that was five years old, what did you do to it in year one? What was the same store sales? It was doing a million bucks. Did you you okay, you got equipment and lab and you saved a couple of percent on that? Great. But did that one million in revenue, did you put systems in place? where staff was feeling more appreciated, rewarded, bonusing more, patients were happier, and you grew that to 1.6 million? 
if you didn't, then what did you really do? I mean, just right. pick some synergies and, you know, so that's that at least that's how we pursue acquisitions we're looking at is just like what value can we bring and if we can't make them better then we're not going to do it and if it's too far away culturally from how we're aligned then we're not going to do it do you think you being a dentist like you know there seems to be a movement too in, in the dso space of like for us by us and um you know you being kind of the face of deca and being a dentist, do you think of that, I mean, I guess I'm kind of answering my own question, like that kind of helped because you, you have the best interest of your, the industry in which you were brought up. Yeah. And so go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And, and I think that is one of the pet peeves, right? Is as DSLs grow, I'd like to see more that are operated by dentists so that at least the clinical quality is not even a question. Like we're not mm -hmm. even debating on where we're putting the best crowns. We're trying to put the best implants. We care about this like systems around the clinical piece, which is that's our business in the book. I talk about core competency. That's our core competency. You can't be in the dental business if you're not a good, not good at dentistry. Um, so yeah, I do. I do think that. And I think I also talk about a little bit, um, you know, I think as dentists, we all became dentists. I can speak for, all three of us and probably every other dentist in the country because we kind of wanted to be our own boss. It was never Hunter. about the money. It was just like, look, I want to have some autonomy and I want to do things if I want to work Saturdays and I want to be off Monday and that's what I want to do. And I'm going to go to school for that. And I'm not asking for you to treat me <laughs> differently. I just want to have autonomy. And I think, you know, you can go own your own practice, which absolutely people should do. I think the next best thing in a dentist view is like, all right, if I can't own my practice and I want to be part of a group, I'd much rather be aligned and partnered with another dentist totally. who is representing my interests. And then the last thing I'd want to do is go for somebody who doesn't even understand what trying to get a patient numb and, and it's not happening and there's an infection and I got to drain and all like, if, so there's a certain, I think, aspect that we have covered and, you know, we have, 300 plus dentists now, but there's a certain level of like, I got you and, and I'm never going to ask you to do something I wouldn't do as a dentist that takes the mystery and the guesswork out of it. So now it's just like, Hey, we're thinking about this. What do you think? You know? And so, yeah, I, I think it's a big factor. There's so many thoughts there with what you're saying too. Cause as you know, we coach a mastermind and dentists all across the nation and we have a bulletproof for a long time. And it's like, there's this weird shame in dentistry, meaning like, I'm not good at SEO and crown preps and injections and business man is like, I'm not good at everything. Therefore, therefore I'm not right. And, and as opposed to like, like what you did kind of as I'm reading the book, you kind of identified where you were strong, where you were passionate. And then you, and you grab people to quickly support that mission that we're going to fill in the space. And, uh, I think that's just so important. I know you're a big fan of kind of like, you know, personality tests and things like that to kind of identify where your superpower is and then live in that lane and, and get people around you kind of to support the mission. Um, I don't really know if there's really a question there other than, you know, we just hear this sentiment with dentistry and for yeah. whatever reason, there's like, well, I don't know anything about marketing. Therefore I must suck. I'm like, no, it's well, unfair. Cause we're not trained. Right. So we're, we're trained at, at very best. We're trained to be adequate dentists. We're mm -hmm. not trained to be proficient dentists when leaving school. Unfortunately, just the nature of the professions. I think, I think you guys are right. And I, I think there should be a huge initiative on, it's not even creating a DSO. I just wish dental schools incorporated more business training and not business training in the sense like there's MetLife and there's Blue Cross and this is what a deductible is. But like, hey, before you go out, here's just some stuff you should know. Mm. And well, Sulman, I tried. I don't know. I know you don't listen to the pod probably regularly, but I tried to do that to the dental school and, and uh, it, it didn't end well. It right? didn't? Oh, what, no. what well, I, I pitched it. I pitched a hissy fit because no one was listening to me kind of thing. And so I was like, what are y'all looking at your phones for? Like, I'm right here. You know, yeah. yeah, I had the president of the ADA on too and asked her the same question, you know, really nice lady, but it was like, Hey, we don't need 15% off our car insurance. We need, you know, mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Dental school costs are spiraling out of control and dentist salaries are flatlining and it doesn't look bright for the future of dentistry. It was, you know, I it's, think it's we should. Crazy. If you think about at a minimum wage increases in the last two years, minimum eight to 10%, right? If you're constructing new offices, the construction costs are through the roof and, and you know, no payers paying us more. Yeah, you can go out and network, but 
you know, it's, it's just, it's been a, I think it's been a very, very tough time for, for Dennis. And like I said, I think they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs, even if you have one location and now you have to pay more for assistance, hygienists, and you can't really charge the patients more. And then you got Dennis at every other corner, you know, doing something different. And it's been a tough time. And I, I think what you guys are doing is great. At least you have this podcast and this avenue where you're connecting to other dentists. So there's, it may not be reaching out to every dental student, but at least you guys are doing something about it. And I think the book was the same thing. It was like, you know, you may not like what I did and everyone may have an opinion. A lot of people will love it and some may not, but it's out there now and, and hopefully just touches and someone's life and changes it, or at least gives him a, a little bit of a blueprint on like, all right, I can go about it this way, or I can reach out to him. And or there's the permission to make mistakes, right? Like you did. And then we all did. And, and, you know, like, this, continue to. <laughs> right. it, yeah, because, you know, and, and, and perfection is the enemy of execution, right? I mean, Tony, is that a Tony Robbins, Craig? You would know. I have no idea. It sounds good uh, to me. Oh, I'll, but I'll, I mean, I'll, that's, that's what, mine actually. That's mine. Yeah. It's just accelerated learning. And I think we're all, you know, especially early back in the days, it's like burn the boats, make the mistakes and right. figure out your path. And, and not you knowing just, what you don't, you know, listen, it, it takes a, a certain amount of ignorance to do what you did. <laughs> so I mean, you didn't, if you would have had somebody right behind you, like we shouldn't do this right now. And yeah, you know, lawyers, a, a lawyer was involved or some CPA, they would have really steered you away from a lot of what you uh, did. You know, it's funny. I think to, Peter's question you asked about like you've done this twice and you have very smart people around you who like you know have great degrees but I think so that does become the challenge right because you can look at data and analyze and analyze and it, it's almost like it paralyzes you. It's like oh Paralyzed. let's not do or anything and and I think that's where you know being that entrepreneur the founder the gut feel the experience is like no we're gonna do this it'll work out it'll be fine watch you know um, and that's ultimately, you know, I, I, in the book, I say, you know, leaders do what others cannot or will, will not do, um, either one. Um, but I think, yeah, I think when you have private equity, you have a lot of smart people that can analyze everything, but ultimately as a leader of the company, you've got to make the decision and say, I strongly feel that this is the direction we're going to take and it's going to work out and, and we're going to learn along the way and, and keep doing that. My, uh, my last question, Craig, and I'll let you, I'll, you can kind of jump in as well, but Again, you have a lot of industry knowledge. You, you see the financial side, you see the dental side, you see kind of the macroeconomic stuff. Um, are you bullish on the future and where do you see dentistry going? Let's just say kind of a, from a prognostication of the next five years, what do you see big changes coming? What should someone be aware of that maybe not in the beginning of this podcast kind of thing? Yeah, I feel very good about dentistry in general. Okay. I feel really good about the DSOs that are doing good quality work and actually care about the patients. Right. I feel really good about the dentists who are doing the same thing in their communities or neighborhoods and they're, they really care about the quality of their work and, and they're doing it under their kind of terms and their pace. I feel really good about that. Consolidation is happening and that is gonna to continue to happen. The same surgeons and orthodontists that five years ago were like, I hate DSOs and right. dentists are now partnering with DSOs and, you know, and it's happening everywhere. Like, you know, even like the older, more traditional places like, you know, the Northeast, where it was like some of the people at, at dental schools that were anti DSOs, it was like the worst thing ever for dentistry are now selling to DSOs. So ultimately, I think what that proves is that, you know, at the end of the day, valuations will kind of dictate and people will kind of give in. So the question then becomes, if you're going down that road, please give in to something that you're actually morally, oh. culturally aligned with so you can do more good as a group together versus just doing it for the sake of doing it at the highest kind of valuation. It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't just stop there. It's your legacy. So you've got to kind of respect that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel really good about the people who are in it for the right reasons, I guess is good. how I'll sum it up. Good. And then just to kind of piggyback on that question, how long do you think, I know this is just looking at your own crystal ball here, but when do you think consolidate, where do you, where do you understand consolidation to be at currently? What percentage of dentists mm -hmm. work under a DSO of some sort at this point? Yeah, there's opinion? varying statistics. I, I think out of the practices and I can actually get you the exact number. Out of dental practices, it's probably 75 to 70% that are already uh, unconsolidated. So 30% are consolidated. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought as well. Right? That's what I would agree with. In terms yeah. of number of 
Dennis, what's happening is you have after COVID, Dennis were like in a retire year or two, they kind of, ex, you know, exited a little bit earlier and you have older Dennis that are retiring. And then you've got this new batch of Dennis that are in all the cities that you guys live in and they want to move in. And they're not traditionally going and opening a new practice. They're joining a group. It could be a group like yours, Peter. It could be a group like yours, Craig. It could be a group like mine. So not even saying they're joining like the huge DSLs, but they're joining a group practice and they're fine doing that. And I, I know just from knowing some of your doctors, We've all had doctors that have been there, you know, a long time and that's their life. They're not looking to leave. They don't want to go do anything else. I think that trend is increasing. I would say, um, and mm -hmm. I, I'll get you the number from the ADSO, but I want to say almost 40% or even a little bit higher of all new uh, dental school graduates are joining a DSO. And, and where do you think you see that apex of consolidation growing. happening? It's going to keep mean growing because what's going to happen is when a dentist wants to own something ideal dental will say we'll partner with you and mm -hmm. they're like yeah i know you guys now and mm -hmm. i'm really happy and i know the quality of dentistry and what it stands i know the pros and the cons let's do it and this all really started um i came up to speak at yankee in boston last year and i brought my son with me because there was a lakers game that weekend and he wanted to come and so we did the speaking thing and i took him to tufts which is my dental school on a friday afternoon and we ran into this young, energetic fourth year student who was going to graduate in May. And, you know, we're just in the elevator ride together. And then the next morning, Saturday morning, we went to the hotel gym and it was part of like a it was a it was part of like an external gym, but connected to hotels. So my son was playing basketball. I was working on it, but I could kind of watch him. And I see this guy talking to my son. So being the protective dad, I run over. And it was the same dental student from the elevator. He's like, oh, hey, I saw you at Tufts. Like, did you go there? I'm like, yeah. When did you go there? Oh, great. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to be graduating May. I could pick your brain when I look at contracts. I'm like, sure. He's like, what's your name and number? I'm like, all right. So I go back to work and odd. And five minutes later, he comes like running, like even more excited. And he's like, ah, I looked you up. Oh, my God, <laughs> whatever. And he's like, I'm from upstate New York. And I'm a third generation. I went to local school and church. And I want to go back. Would you do an ideal dental with me? Would you open one there with me? And I was just like, you yeah, know, shit, like why, why can't, or why am I not doing that? You know, um, right. because there's so much trust at so many different levels. One, it's a dentist. Two, I went to his dental school. Three, I've proven something, you know? And so that's where this whole JV thing. Kind yeah, of I love the joint model. venture model. I like when I got to that point in your book, I was like, yeah, that's such an obvious, let's hold hands together and like kind of, kind of, you stood on the shoulders of giants and that's now you kind of reaching down and pulling others up. Um, Honestly, you know, and, I had that opportunity. Like when I was there, I don't, you know, I tell this off to people all the time. I, if I graduated now, I don't think I'd be doing or going down the route that I went, you know, I would, because mm -hmm. times have changed, I'd mm -hmm. probably pick something, you know, and, and do you think you wouldn't have the ability to do that soul man? Or is it just like, what, what, what's that? What's the reason for that? I don't know. That? The dynamics have just changed. It's, it's very Economic. tough to come out and, and just go out and, you know, ignorance is bliss. I, I, I meet dentists who are coming out through friends or family. They're like, will you talk to this? You know, they're just graduating. And they'll sit right across from me, like, as far as you guys are on the screen. I'll be like, I'm like, yeah, so what's going on? They're like, no, I just want to meet you because I want to do what you, you know, what you did. <laughs> but course. I want to do it, like, a little bit faster. <laughs> And, right, know, right, right. It's like sitting there, you're like one of us is an idiot. It's either me or you because mm -hmm. I can do it fast enough, or or you think you're going to do it fast enough. But what is your tolerance to eat glass, and how long can you do it for? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think it's it's just a much tougher climate because back then, you know, when we started in DFW, there wasn't a lot of other. I mean, there was competition, but people groups were moving in, you know, and they'd come in and open 15 at one time. I was like, holy cow, like, how did they do that? You know? And, you know, and then I, I think now it's just different. There's, there's just a lot of competition and you guys know this, like you have your domains in your area and it's, it would be very tough for somebody new to come and open up across the street and compete because they would, they would be targeting different patients, but not necessarily your patients. Um, so I think the challenges, the costs are a lot higher. Um, the ability to negotiate with pairs is a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're just starting out, you have no clue what that even means, even though you think you're doing a great job. So it's just, um, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but what you don't know today is a lot more than what you didn't know 15 years ago, if that makes sense.
It like, does. The gap in the the competitiveness and, and the aggression around everything that's happening is com compounded right now. And then what do you think as a, a final thought, because I want to be respectful of your time, what do you think about like with this last few years of zero interest rate policy and there's a lot of people that gobbled up a lot of practices that were just really in our play where they're trying to aggregate. What do you think happens to with you know that segment of our market? What's going to happen? Is it happening already? Yeah. Are there, are there, is there blood in the streets in these circles? I think they go refi and get a bigger tranche and keep rolling it all and, and, and you know, kicking the can down the road. But the, the problem is going to be when they try to sell. And what you're going to see is the whole time is going to get longer and longer because the math doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible. If you're if you were paying nine, 10 times to buy practices at the lower interest rates, you have to pay five or six times now and forget about what you're going to do after because everyone's like, oh, but I paid that. But then after a year with the synergies, where it was only seven times. Well, <laughs> you know, and then the goal was like, I'm going to buy something at nine and exit at 11 or 12. Well, now if you're buy you can't buy it at that, then you have to either overpay and just hope uh, with time that things, you know, but I think we're going to see that this year and in the next 18 months, I think the tides are going to drop and we're going to see what's, what's kind of left behind. Yeah. And that probably has some spillover too, just because of those, you know, bad actors that acquired the wrong you know, they, they got the wrong acquisition. I think it hurts all of us. You know, it absolutely does. It's not, it's not as easy as, you know, it's been played out to be, you know, I think all we see or hear is like, Oh, like this is the revenue and this is the valuation. This is the number of locations. I mean, that's just a small part. Like ask people like, well, what was the debt on that valuation? You know, if, because that's, that's, the, the, the valuation minus the debt is what's left for the shareholders, right? And it's like, do you want to live that life where you have a lot of debt all the time? You're carrying that. Um, and then, yeah, you get this big number, but it's really not that big once you take the debt away. Yeah. Well, that was awesome. So, man, is there yeah, uh, so any good talking to you guys? It was yeah, man, you too. To see you guys. It was yeah. refreshing. Likewise, and uh, hardcover book comes out May 7th. Again, I truly loved it. It was a real gift that you made for the profession, Solomon. I, I feel that way strongly. I, I told everybody, all my dentist friends, get the book, read it. It's really forthcoming. You really held nothing back. And it's like a playbook for those that want to do something. Mm -hmm. Even if you just want to, you know, be a dentist in an organization, it's helpful. The fact that you give suggestions on how to master, you know, the clinical experience as well, like with calling patients, or if you want to become uh, uh, the next uh, dental entrepreneur, it's valuable for everybody. Ah, oh, thanks a lot. And and when does this podcast come out? And is it on? Is it I follow it on Instagram, or how do I go about that? It'll probably come out pretty quickly, quite honestly. Um, yeah, before so the book, in for about sure. A week, in about a week, yeah, before the book. So um, on, on bulletproof on instagram no it'll be on po apple podcasts okay. and where you and i think spotify too i don't know where they push it but um you know again the technical. under bulletproof and in, in under podcasts bulletproof dental practice okay. pod yes. Yes. yep and then sulman also uh just don't know if you're busy on june 14th and 15th but you happen to find yourself in the scottsdale phoenix area we have our um summit coming up love to have you there so if that no, works, it's your busy season. Looking at the, my it's the same weekend. It's, it's the same yeah. weekend. Yeah. Oh, you guys weekend. Okay. I'll, I'll be in Denver. So I'll keep that in mind. I'd love to pop in. Yeah. Well, one of them. I'd love to have you at for sure. One of those. I would love we've been, that. We've been inviting you, uh, with threatening to, to bring you to one for years. So I want to check it out. I know you guys get great reviews from that. And, uh, and thanks for the kind words on, on the book too. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, buddy. All right. All right, bye. Okay. See Take ya. care, guys.